Wonder Woman, with all the extraordinary qualities of Greek gods, made her debut in a world torn by the wars of men, also known as December 1941. Pearl Harbor was bombed that month, and paranoia birthed superheroes such as Superman and Captain America. Before the end of her introduction, she'll take down a gang of Nazis. However, it's not patriotism that created her. Rather, she is the product of a couple of things I'm going to tell you about tonight. Psychology, feminism, and the love of three people. The classic Wonder Woman comics are credited to Charles Moulton, which is, of course, a pseudonym. The author was, in fact, William Moulton Marston, a controversial psychologist and author. Born in Massachusetts in 1893, Marston was an eccentric from childhood. For instance, his hobby was taxidermied birds. In, earth gra in eighth grade, he fell in love with a classmate named Sadie Elizabeth Holloway, a fierce and fearless migrant from the Isle of Man. You can probably guess what their next chapter is. They stayed in contact through high school and university, marrying in 1915. The recent film, Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman, portrays the pair as endlessly intelligent, refreshingly at ease with themselves, and achingly ahead of their time, possibly even our time. In 1911, Holloway went to Mount Holyoke, the first women's college in the United States. Marston went to Harvard. It was there, as a depressed 18-year-old undergraduate student, he attended a lecture given by Emmeline Pankhurst. Originally to speak on campus, the lecture was barred by the university, moving to a dance hall a block away. Designed to, own, to hold only 500 people and open to students from Harvard and its sister school, Radcliffe only, 1,500 showed up, climbing up walls and through windows to hear Pankhurst speak about male ignorance and authority. Marston's interest in suffrage had originated in high school, but his interest further peaked. He was also increasingly interested in a burgeoning science. Until the early 1900s, psychology was thought of as a branch of philosophy, including by pioneering professor William James, who offered the first course in the United States at Harvard in 1875. In the, in the 1900s, James invited German psychologist Hugo Munsterberg to build a laboratory. Munsterberg's research concerned perception, emotion, reaction, and sensation, doing extensive research on his students, particularly women. Gertrude Stein, who went on to be an iconic writer and also, ho and also hosted the lights of Picasso and Hemingway in her Paris salon, ended up as, in the lab as a Radcliffe student in 1894 various body parts strapped to, trapped, and caught in contraptions. Munsterberg was attempting to locate her mind. <laughs> Marston began studying with Munsterberg in 1912. The professor so impressed he hired him as an assistant at Radcliffe. Marston was his last student. By then, Munsterberg was distressed and under increasing scrutiny for his allegiance to Germany. Both searched for a way to find the truth, Marston experimenting with machines. Munsterberg had attempted this a decade before, hypothesizing that an exact science of testimony would replace standards of proof. In 1913, his junior year, Marston drew up an experiment. What if systolic blood pressure could detect a lie? He enlisted his then partner Holloway, and together they experimented on 10 students. Marston took their base blood pressure with a cuff attached to a machine that recorded each change in rhythm on graph paper. Sitting behind a screen, he then questioned them about a fictional crime that a friend of theirs had been accused of, as a jury watched. The subject was told to say something that could save their friend, and to do that by lying or being truthful. The jury picked whether the subject was lying or not around half of the time. Marston was correct 96% of the time, or 103 out of 107 subjects. He had invented the lie detector. While another prototype would become the one bought by law enforcement, still used today, Marston came upon using systolic blood pressure as a unit of measurement. After marrying in 1915 and graduating, Marston and Holloway went to law school. He, he at Harvard, but the university did not accept women, so she went to Boston University. When they graduated in 1918 and took the bar exam together, Holloway finished it first. In 1919, Marston entered Harvard's PhD in philosophy and Holloway an MA program at Radcliffe. 
They weren't the same material from the same professors, but Holloway was never awarded the degree. Women weren't admitted to doctoral programs. Marston's research was really her research, she said. In 1921, Marston graduated with a PhD. In the next four years, he'd be arrested for fraud, fired from universities, and administer his experiments to people all over the United States. He slipped further and further down the academic ladder. In 1925, he was hired as an assistant professor of philosophy at Tufts University in Massachusetts. Holloway was in New York, editing psychology journal Child Study, a journal of parent education. Now, our third person, and no, it's not Wonder Woman yet. In Marston's first semester at Tufts, into his experimental psychology class walked 21-year-old Olive Byrne. Now, she wasn't just any other student. Remember Marston's in fa fascination with Emmeline Pankhurst when I say this. She was the daughter of Ethel Byrne and the niece of Margaret Sanger. Ethel Byrne, for those who don't know, was a radical feminist and vocal advocate for birth control. And Margaret Sanger was an activist, sex educator, and nurse. They believed in free love, socialism, and feminism. Together, they opened the first birth control clinic in the United States, establishing what would eventually become Planned Parenthood. They belonged to a family of 11, their mother becoming pregnant 18 times in 22 years before dying at age 49. When Olive was two years old, Ethel took her and her brother to their grandparents' house and disappeared to New York to study nursing. Married women were not allowed to study nursing. After the grandparents died, Olive, aged 10, was sent to a Catholic orphanage. Very ironic. <laughs> One can imagine what Marston and Holloway would have thought of his new student. When they find out about her lineage in the recent film, their awed reaction is if a celebrity has appeared before them. Olive Byrne became Marston's assistant in 1925, conducting experiments on what he called captivation, observing how others responded to domination. Whether they did anything else that year is unknown. When she graduated the next year, however, he left, perhaps fired his dubious research methods and relationships found out once again. But Byrne enrolled in graduate school in psychology at Columbia, living and working with Marston and Holloway. Whether the relationship was mutual between all three people is debated. Various historical writings argue that it was, while biological descendants from Holloway deny it. This, the recent film imagines this reveal as a delicious meeting point between their work and themselves. Confessed after strapping one another to a lie detector in, de in the dead of night, if only finding out one's true feelings is really that simple. Reg but regardless, they did in fact live together as a family for decades. It was an arrangement that worked for all. Explained as they went along. Holloway had a career keeping the family afloat by working for companies such as Encyclopedia Britannica, as Marston moved between jobs and new grand schemes while Byrne raised their four children together and wrote for Family Circle. Marston was a frequent interview subject, the pretense of them being strangers barely disguised. It's a history so fascinating that you forget that Wonder Woman is actually yet to come. By the late 1930s, Marston was a pop psychologist writing self-help books with titles like You Can Be Popular and March On, Facing Life With Courage. In a 1940 interview with Family Circle, Marston extolled the virtues of the great educational potential of comic books. It wasn't the first time Marston had seen entertainment as a powerful outlet for his theories. While a student, he had written movie scripts, and in the late 1920s, he was a psychologist for Universal Pictures, forecasting public reactions to films. Following the interview, he was hired as an educational consultant to what would later become DC Comics, a proof of creating a female superhero, one ruling with love and not violence. It was Elizabeth's idea. Fine, but make her a woman, she said. Wonder Woman is constructed from the trailblazing Byrne and Holloway, their personalities and histories, imbuing her world in a staggering number of entertaining winks. Here's a few. She's an Amazon, sculpted from clay by her mother, who hails from the all-female utopia Paradise Island and rescues women from men. Amazons were popular in the 1910 New York of Ethel Byrne and Margaret Sanger, symbols of independence, practicing voluntary motherhood, bearing only daughters, and ruling the world peacefully before being threatened by men. She leaves the island and becomes a secretary, her real self a secret. She takes dictations in Greek. Both Marston and Holloway were fascinated by mythology, the latter particularly with Sappho, a poet from the island of Lesbos who became a symbol of female love. Suffering Sappho became Wonder Woman's catch cry. 
Holloway, Byrne and Marston had secret wives as well. Home was Paradise Island, their life with each other. Wonder Woman attends Holiday College, a mashup of Holloway's name and her alma mater, where she observes the same unorthodox sorority rituals, much too outlandish to explain here, that Byrne had shown Marston in the 1920s. It was this kind of working around the senses that Marston had honed in his Universal Pictures days, slipping the salacious between the lines. However, the comic still generated outrage from family groups. Wonder Woman binds her enemies with her magic lasso that compels them to tell the truth, and her bullet deflecting bracelets were based on the heavy silver ones worn by Byrne. Dr. Munsterberg even appears as Dr. Psycho. The comic was met with instant success and criticism in print ever since, except for four months in 1986. The last six years of Marston's life were devoted to writing the comics. After he died of cancer in 1947, Wonder Woman was stripped of her powers until the, until the 1970s, when a spot on the cover of Gloria Steinem's Ms. magazine would see them revived, a popularity that has only grown in decades since. Some of Marston's feminism and experiments may seem absurd and even offensive today, but the impact of Wonder Woman, created in equal measure by Olive Byrne and Elizabeth Holway Marston, who lived together for the rest of their lives, nearly 40 years after Marston died, is felt as deeply today. She is born of feminism, science, and most importantly, love, a reminder of struggle and sacrifice. I think one of the most telling quotes to sum all that went into Wonder Woman up is this, which she says at the end of the fourth episode after freeing a group of prisoners. You saved yourselves. I only showed you that you could. Thank you. Ella Donald, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>